Today's topic, nine medical malpractice insurance questions that every physician should know. I'm sure you are very familiar with the term medical malpractice. It's probably a term that you knew about maybe even before you decided to officially start medical school, but it is a very vital topic that oddly enough, a lot of medical professionals don't even understand the basics of what this is, what it covers, what it does do, what it doesn't do. But if you ever have to go through one of these events, I hope you never do. But if you do, not only is it time consuming, not only does it take a huge toll on your professional life, but also your personal life. If it goes the wrong way, it could also be a financial catastrophe for not only you, but also your family. So in today's video, we're going to walk through nine important questions that you should know, or at least help give you some guidance on what is actually happening with this insurance that you now have. So stay tuned. That's all coming up next. First up, let's start with the basics. What is medical malpractice? Medical malpractice is when a physician would make an error or an omission in their medical treatment process. And in this example, it would cause harm to the patient. Now, the patient would have to sue, and then that's where we would start to kind of see the process really kick in. Keep in mind, every state is dramatically different. Some states have better protections for physicians, while others don't have much protection at all. And this is very vital to understand. Some of them will have caps, some of them won't have caps. There are some states that will actually make the person who files the claim pay a fee if they find out it was essentially just, I don't love the term, but ambulance chasing. You need to understand your state's rules. You need to understand the definitions of what's actually in your medical malpractice insurance policy, what it covers, what it doesn't cover. But for a simple example, medical malpractice is when a physician has made an error or an omission that has caused harm or damage to the patient. Next up, how does a medical malpractice suit work? Again, ideally, you never need to know any of this, but traditionally, you're going to see six steps. Here's what it looked like more or less from the patient side. They're going to meet with an attorney. They're going to consult with a medical expert. They're going to file a case. This is probably when you're notified on, oh no, type moment. They're going to conduct an investigation. They're hopefully, if you're at this point, you could settle out of court. That is not all that uncommon. However, if it does not settle out of court, this is when you're going to trial. So those are the six high level steps. Obviously there's a lot of stuff happening here. There are even different states might have different steps on what allows you to get to that next step. That's essentially the basis of what you're gonna see in a medical malpractice lawsuit. Why do patients sue doctors? Literally, you could probably say they multi-million dollar question. It could be something based on, hey, there was damages done. There was harm done. I think those are probably your most common. It could be to hold a physician accountable for some type of negligence. It could be a patient that passed away and now their family asking for compensation but to feel whole again for their very large loss in that situation. In particular, certain specialties are going to be more at risk than others. And the article that we listed in our blog post, I'll read off the most common specialties that need to worry about medical malpractice. And those are neurosurgeons, cardiovascular surgeons, general surgeons, OBGYNs. On the other side of it, the least amount of medical malpractice suits go to psychiatrists, pediatricians, and family general practitioners. Those are the least sued or the least amount of cases of medical malpractice, where that first group there were the highest amount of medical malpractice. And I think it makes sense, whether you're a physician or not, and you think about those specialties on why certain groups might have a higher liability than others, and it just kind of comes with the amount of specialization even in those types of procedures. Tough question to answer outright. There probably is about a million different answers, but those are the more general ones. Those are the more common ones that you're going to see that also have some context behind them and some research to say like, hey, these are the most common ones that we're seeing based on these reasons. Next up, you're probably sitting there thinking, how can I prevent this from happening as a physician? And once again, I'm gonna reference the blog post here to kind of read through a few different things, but it's really one of those ones where you're just really continuing to always own your craft, continue to note why you did this, why you did that, bring in other specialists as well. So the most common examples that we see on possible ways to prevent malpractice is continuously developing your skills and knowledge, which I think that would make sense. Confer with other doctors and specialists. 
get another opinion besides your own. If you have another physician that says, yes, I agree. If you have two physicians, you know, three physicians that are like, yes, that is the same course of action we would have taken as well. And those are things that are gonna always help. Other ones that we listed on here is always paying attention to the details, making sure you have adequate support. So again, having a good team with you, I always come back to note, 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 detail everything on why you did this or you did that. The last two we list on, on the blog post, which again are in the notes here for the video is, you know, avoid over rushing and overworking. I know what you're thinking. We're physicians, we're all overworked. I agree with you. There's probably a million other topics we could plug in there on why that's also a problem. But for now, let's just use that as an example on things that you can try to avoid. And then the last one we have, do no harm. I know what you're saying. No kidding, Chad, we get it. But those are usually the main things that we're listing or at least talking through. And we're saying like, hey, these are ways to avoid it. And more than likely, you're not gonna see these topics from your financial planner all that often. You're probably having different courses through the hospital where they're trying to teach you these little things. And it could be things that are annoying. As I always describe on our side of things for the compliance attorneys that keep us in line, it's annoying, but it keeps you safe. So a lot of those different things that you're probably doing at the hospital on, hey, this is why we take notes here, and this is why we do this, and this is why we count the amount of pads and the syringes and this and that to make sure nothing's sewed up inside of them. It's because of these types of events to make sure that you are covering all your basis. Next one we have is how can doctors avoid litigation? And I probably could have combined these last two questions here, four and five, because they really do go together. It's not as simple as do no harm. We know that. We know that as a physician, you're not going in there with the intent to hurt someone. In this example where a medical malpractice suit has fired up, sometimes it's just as simple as always listening to your patient's concerns, clearly walking through your process, your recommendations on why why we're doing this but not this and here's why we think this is the best route and the patient confirms yes i'm good with that i love that this makes sense to me sometimes it's the little things that go a long way here one of the best ways to avoid litigation is just always being very clear in your communications as well both from a listening perspective but also discussing what your procedures will be with your patients there. Next up, how can you protect your personal asset? This is one of my favorite topics. In the physician world, this is where we really get into the terms of asset protection. Medical malpractice is going to do its best to protect you. However, if you lose and it's above your medical malpractice limits, we start to hit a danger zone. Things that you can do to help limit the risk on your personal assets can include a lot of topics. Some things are easier than others. Like if you live in one of the 18 states that allow tenants by the entirety, that's a good way to add an asset protection. It could be as simple as what we call LLC. If you have rental properties, make sure that they are in their own LLC. If you have snowmobiles, jet skis, ATV, anything like that, have those in their own LLC. Have an umbrella policy. Umbrella insurance is so low cost and it's gonna add extra personal liability. And as your assets really start to grow, you're probably gonna to start to get into some form of trust planning in particular, irrevocable trust planning because a revocable trust is not gonna do much for you in the term of asset protection. Other things that you can do here besides those main ones, and this is where we get into state-specific rules as well, having more money in your retirement accounts. ERISA safeguards a lot of those 401ks, 403bs, and that thing is pretty much ironclad. Most states offer pretty solid protections on IRAs, Roth IRAs, but you gotta read the fine print too because this can get as detailed as HSAs, 529 plans, what's the equity in your home, sometimes labeled as a homestead exemption. Some states will allow tenants by the entirety even for personal property like your home. So you need to pay attention to all these things. Now, again, I hope you never get to this phase. Physicians always think in medical malpractice, but remember, let's just say you have a non-physician house and they get into a fender bender with their car. This is still another area for asset protection. So these these topics are very important, whether it's from the medical side or just, hey, I'm driving to the grocery store side. Keep that in mind. Make sure you are putting proper protections in place. You need to be proactive. You cannot be reactive. If you're reactive, you're going to be in some serious trouble if this goes against you and it's above your medical malpractice limit. So just be smart here. Be proactive. Next up is how much coverage do you need? How much medical malpractice insurance do you need? You do not want your CFP giving you this answer. I can give you general guidelines here, but you do not want a CFP telling you this. The most common numbers that you're gonna see are a one and three million. One million per occurrence, three million in total. Those are very common. 
However, you should base this on your specialty. Remember, 20% of malpractice claims are towards neurosurgeons. In that example, they may have more. Now, if you're in the academic world, they probably are gonna have a pretty strong policy in there for you already because they know where the liabilities are. They have a lot of smart attorneys on their side. Remember, you need to think through this in all aspects as well. You need to know the actual limits based on specialty. Could also be your preference, right? Maybe you just wanna be a little bit more risk averse. I guess that's a proper way to say it. And the idea of you want to make sure that you have extra coverage in place. Some states might have better protection. So you might opt to take a little bit lower because we know that medical malpractice is not cheap. Another topic that I won't get into in the video, but I will have a note on in the actual blog post, which again, link is in the notes below. Just make sure you understand tail coverage as well. That's one of the, probably the most important aspects of the medical malpractice insurance, especially when going to your next hospital. So you were at hospital A, but now you're moving to another practice and at hospital B, you wanna make sure that you still have coverage for past procedures as well. In summary, that's what tail coverage is. I'm not gonna give you the answer because it can vary, most commonly, you're going to see one and three million, which again, that's one policy where it's one million per occurrence, three million in total. That's pretty common on what we see on a broad scope of different specialties. Coming towards the end here, where should you get medical malpractice insurance? For most academic medical physicians, you probably never have to worry about that. It's kind of just embedded in there. It's something that you get as part of your contract per se. But if you're independent or the one I always bring up is make sure that if you are working at one hospital, but you're moonlighting or just doing a side gig with 1099 income from another medical role, make sure your actual medical malpractice is covering both of those. Sometimes if you read the fine print on an academic policy, it might say, hey, we only cover you here. Just make sure that if you're in private practice or you open up your own business, that's probably where this question will come up more often. Some of the more common ones we're going to see out there, the doctor's company, medical Protective, which is usually shortened up to MedPro, Healthcare Provider Service Organization. We also listed a few others in there. Um, number nine on there is why are we seeing costs come down, which has been a good fit. That's been a really nice feature we've seen over the past few years here. And a lot of it has been because medicine is becoming a little bit more modernized. So there's better precautions in place. Some states are doing better at protecting and also putting some precautions in place so that I know you used this term earlier. It's not the most official term, but quote unquote, ambulance chasing type policy. They're now putting some better precautions in place there. You kind of plug in all these things of just modernization, better protections in place. Technology is helping a lot of physicians also just take better notes and be proactive. So this is going to add a stronger case on, hey, it wasn't negligence. So here's why. Another nice feature that we are seeing as of late is premiums have started to come down. Will that trend continue? We'll see, but that's also a nice thing that we have seen recently here. And there you have it. Nine medical malpractice questions that every physician should know the answer to. Yes, technically there was eight because I combined two, but you get the point. The reason why we like to put content out on topics like this is because it's still amazing on how many physicians don't actually understand all the workings of these types of policies. Whenever we're seeing a question come up repeatedly from our clients or either in our blog posts or if we're just getting email questions from miscellaneous physicians out there, we start to see trends. We like to write about them, whether it's the blog or the YouTube video or in this example, both. So as always, Thank you for tuning in for the last 15 minutes or so here. Uh, we hope we gave you some good content, maybe refresh your memory on some things here. If you have not subscribed to the channel, now would be a great time. Also, if you click on the little bell icon, uh, you'll get a notification every time we release new content. Our goal is to continue to provide very great content to help you on this financial planning journey of yours. For now, thank you for tuning in and I'll catch you on the next video.